Bone Tomahawk stars Kurt Russell from The Thing, Tombstone, and 50 other good movies, Patrick Wilson from The Conjuring, Matthew Fox from Lost, Richard Jenkins from The Cabin in the Woods, David Arquette from Scream, Sid Haig, aka Captain Spaulding, and Lily Simmons from Gotham and Banshee. It's a western drama horror written and directed by S. Craig Zoller, with a tiny budget of $1.8 million, and I really didn't have high expectations when I first rented this movie. Being pretty much a lifetime Kurt Russell and The Thing fan, there was a solid cast and an interesting trailer. I was just hoping for a good watch. Quickly, I fell in love with the clever dialogue, and then the four main characters, and it wasn't long until I was hooked. Immersed into the story and prepared to go on this journey as our leads prepared to leave town on a dangerous rescue mission. It's overflowing with macho masculinity, and I was shocked when I realized this movie is a full-blown love story. And it all starts with that brutal opener. Swiftly setting up the tone, Purvis cuts a sleeping man's throat, robbing two travelers with his buddy, buddy. These two degenerates kick off the event that'll push the story forward. Both David Arquette and Sid Haig give brief yet solid performances taking advantage of the brilliant dialogue for these two numbskulls. You didn't cut them deep enough. Had a lot of blood, an unusual amount. Do you hear that? That's a real musical gust. This is not the time for womanly imaginings. Ain't no concern of a civilized man. Let's slow down with the dick sucking though. Purvis's teeth go from sparkling actor white to over the top dirty in between edits. This leads to our first look at this troglodyte tribe. Following an ominous sound, one cannibal attacks. The heavy footsteps beat any musical jump scare any day. Don't worry, that's just a scratch. Title card. Huh, no opening credits? The eerie whistle overall in the movie is a fantastic touch. It's great here and there's a number of different scenes where it happens throughout. I added them up. Here they are. They're great each time. Now connecting to what's coming, it would have been cool if there was a shadow watching him bury the stolen goods. This scene introduces Sheriff Hunt, who is fantastic in the role, and the backup deputy, Chicory. My favorite performance from this actor, hands down. This scene plays out over soup. Ooh, that tea smells gruesome. It's soup. You think I could have some? Nab that chair and sit. And witnessing a stranger acting suspicious, and it still manages to become one of my favorite scenes. Do you think you can drink this without burning your mouth? Oh, I like challenges. Chicory hesitates a moment. I was out on a ramble. Put some fresh flowers on Nadine's grave. You know telling us he's probably a bit lost without his wife around, and Sheriff Hunt kind of looks after him. Make sure you have a couple of good meals every day. Making sure he eats enough, keeps him busy, gives him something to smile about frequently throughout the story. This tastes like corn. It's corn chowder. Oh, then things are lining up. Sex scene is a touch pointless. The poem, on the other hand, is better, and it shows the love they have for each other. That ain't a poem. Mr. Bruder, played by Matthew Fox, and he's fucking awesome in this role, fetches Samantha to pull a bullet out of a prisoner, and the dialogue continues strong. Doc Taylor's in his cups? Deep. John! Yes? If you make any flirtatious remarks in my wife's presence, I'll be a reckoning. I'll behave, cowboy. The stable boy death provides a sudden burst of violence, keeping the gore hounds happy, plus it sets up the story flow for the next morning. Why are you in my breakfast? All the effects are practical, so I don't know how, but they're missing the arrow. Speaking of arrows, this is an odd spot. I mean, was the door open? Did no one see or hear anything? How did they pick the right building? Arthur rushes off without even putting his boots on. It's a quick moment, and he shows us that he cares about nothing except for his wife's abduction. It's a good choice having the professor be Native American. It fits the story exposition, and this line is important. A man like you would not distinguish them from Indians, even though there's something else entirely. That's for everyone screaming it's racist. Having a Native American bad guy doesn't mean the writer in Hollywood thinks every Native American is believed to be like that. 
Remembering this is a super low budget movie, showing the townsfolk adds to the world. They can reuse this set again, plus it keeps the story flow going. Why was my husband, the mayor, not informed of this situation immediately? Uh, well, the sheriff, he told me to, to go get him, but I'm old and I forgot. You expect me to believe that? I'm hoping. Matthew Fox expertly plays John Bruder. And I've killed more Indians than everyone here put together. And it's a great character. He's not a bad guy, but he's not a good guy either. He shares qualities from both. That score, it is sad yet driving. Are any of you somnambulists? That's private. You need to sleep well. Oh. No, I don't. Bruder is cocky. Don't count on me to save you. But he can back it up. His character type adds to the mix. I'm the most intelligent man here. Well, you're the most intelligent man here, is that a fact? Sheriff Hunt has a wife, so does Mr. O'Dwyer. And you're a widower. What has that got to do with anything? Smart men don't get married. Well, that reaction. My first viewing, I was mixed on how I felt watching an injured Arthur O'Dwyer. At first, I felt like it got in the way of the story, but later on, I see it plays a huge part in the story. Until then, it actually showcases the pain and discomfort he's willing to endure to rescue his wife. I've watched a few westerns in my time, Tombstone, Young Guns, Unforgiven, Wyatt Earp, but there's something about this dialogue that has an air of authenticity to it. It's either real or very believable. You use that stuff, you'll spill from the saddle. Which is important for period pieces. My wife used to call me a dumb imbecile all the time. Felt kinda nice. At first it feels like they're gonna ride off and chase down the bad guys, but slowly we start to see all the different dangers and struggles they'll have to face, like strangers sneaking up to your camp. I mean, what do you do? They might want to rob you, they're probably scouts for a raiding party, or they're just travelers, innocent men, just as worried about you as you are about them. What do you do? I mean, do you kill them? Do you let them go? Oh, oh shit. <laughs> Alright, Mr. Bruder chose to kill them. Mr. Bruder, just educated two Mexicans on the meaning of manifest destiny. Little edit fail, the fire changes. Yes, Hunt tosses dirt on the fire so it dims it, so he can see the strangers better without being blinded by the light, I'm assuming. But it's blazing after he does it, and then it's suddenly out. The characters play it smart and they move the camp, which is good. These characters aren't dumb like that, so we don't want them falling for dumb mistakes. They get attacked anyway. Bruder taking a friggin' knife in the shoulder, and that shit is scary. Being attacked in your sleep in that environment? It doesn't ruin the scene for me, but yeah, it looks like he's holding a knife under his armpit. Might have looked better if it was, I don't know, taped to his, you know, body under his arm. Maybe his arm was loose and not tucked in, and then he pulls it out. I'm still happy everything's practical, but I, I gotta call it. Saucy would never allow some greaser on her back. You trained her in bigotry? She's smart. The night attack is a cool moment, and it racks up the tension, putting the pressure on them, now having to travel by foot. Thank you for your service. Plus, losing his horse humanizes Bruder, the colder of the four. Sorry about Saucy. This group of men have their differences, yet instead of drowning us in conflict amongst themselves, they react more authentically and true to each character, which is far more enjoyable than conflict overdose. We'll carry your stuff. This edit keeps us in Arthur's shoes. He's exhausted, lays down, and time to go. Damn, spoke too soon. This is brief, and the apology follows quickly, which is a solid part of the scene, but she is my whole everything. Comes off a bit limp, and we get it already. Could have used a simple polish. Plot-wise, this is great, because now it puts Arthur down, delaying him hours behind the others as they press on. Leaving a four-rock trail is a simple solution to how Arthur follows behind. For some, the journey getting here might frustrate them because they're so focused on the troglodyte confrontation. However, it's more than that. It's the struggle and tough terrain, starting out slick and clean. So this is it. They're finally where they need to be to rescue their people, and already they're sweaty, dirty, bloody, exhausted. Personally, this is the standout moment, expertly crafted, and a very powerful emotional explosion. It begins with a patient six-minute buildup of footsteps, 
whispered talking, I'll signal once I've made a determination. Scouting an entrance, following horse tracks, a tense moment with the watch and timer. Now at the mouth of the cave, a swift crushing blow. They are almost completely wiped out and overpowered before you can even catch your breath. This extra's fall is a little too typical of the dramatic Hollywood hands up type. Bruder getting wrecked here was a crushing blow, performed consistently well, and especially his final moments. <laughs> Losing the best gunslinger out of the bunch cranks up the tension. Yes, it would have been awesome to get just one more scene of him getting in some action, taking out two or three troglodytes before the end, but it is a plus how grounded his wound feels, leaving him in shock and wobbly from the sudden blood loss. Aw oh, gross, he's spitting out of his neck. Totally feel for the characters here as Hope just fucks off for the day. Even if it was another hidden or off-screen shooter, this edit is clunky and stiff. You expect to see the person shooting the bow. I mean, it came from that direction. Holy shit, I think this actor is really strangling Kurt Russell. Hmm, I wonder if he likes it. Anyway, this is great. It looks great. Our heroes are fucked. If only he was a younger, skinnier female. Then he can just toss the troglodyte's thong wearing ass with one hand. His hat is all over the place between edits, which is distracting. For those that missed it, try unseeing it now. Cool visual to go with our first on-screen eerie whistle. Mrs. O'Dwyer's alive, and the timeline actually matches up. Don't do this, please! Yikes on that delivery. Ah! Shit is brutal. They got the look down. Boar Bone Leader is ugly. A small amount of people got turned off by this next scene, but I say... Fuck it. Is it disturbing? You bet your shit stain split in the slit ass crack it is. But it's like five seconds of true gore in two plus hours. It's a shame some people write it off as depraved once we see a human being being prepped for food. They seem to imply people crave and get off in a sick way to disgusting gore when that's so far from the truth. Well, for me it is. The gore is crucial for certain scenes. In this scene, if we only hear the screaming and it cuts off, oh well, something bad happened. Yikes, they're in trouble. But witnessing it, we get as close as we can to feeling how truly horrible that is for everyone. Anyway, it's one hell of a practical effect. It is gross as shit, and it's truly effective. I don't fidget easy when it comes to gore, and this one had me fidget. Deputy Nick was brutalized and eaten. You're idiots! This is probably the main moment to sour me on the Samantha character and not enjoy this moment at all. They traveled, living and sleeping very uncomfortably and in a dangerous land solely to save her. Idiots! Survived a raiding party and getting stabbed. Idiots! Horses stolen, going in on foot with one guy having a broken leg to save her. Idiots! Took an arrow to the arm, a whack to the head, a rock to the face, losing a hand, swiftly followed by losing his life to save her. Idiots! I think I'm starting to come around. Yeah. They are idiots for saving this ungrateful bitch. Are they idiots once you're saved and two brave men die for it? Idiots. Flask was open when thrown into the fire. <laughs> the final reveal of the throat whistle is gross and cool and even better because it's all practical. Seriously, imagine that in CGI. The rescue team went in, clobbered within seconds, beaten and locked up. Now, our only friggin' hope is the exhausted man with a broken leg. It's a great setup. Arthur is clever, choosing to go around and also using the neck whistle to lure out the enemy. Oh, that's fucking gross. If anyone's gonna argue a scene should get cut, I can understand them picking the flea circus discussion. However, Richard Jenkins is terrific here. I knew it was all the I just failed. And it also gives the Samantha character a moment to show her sweet side. How does anyone argue against practical gore effects? Oh shit, I squirm every time. Tension builds up off the troglodyte, not knowing how to use the rifle. There's one in here with a well executed scene. The boar bone troglodyte, why is it hard saying that? He changes his position between edits. Yo, dude is a beast. Nice touch using his own bone tomahawk to finish him off. 
I love this defiant victory stance, but with wounds too severe, he crumbles to his knees. It's like one last twisted joke. He might be okay. Yeah, no, he got properly fucked up. Arthur. <sighs> This fucking redefines badass. He's got a flask hanging out of his side, and he's chilling, ready to shoot the last three trog dogs. Say goodbye to my wife. I'll say hello to yours. There's a sweet friendship between these old dogs. It plays out in front of us organically through the movie, and the end doesn't drown us in an over-the-top dramatic moment. Just one heartbreaking wave of the hand that speaks, death is coming. There's no reason to have words about it. And this is true to the character, calling back to the scene with his wife. Riding out Lorna, into the territory. There isn't an option. Let's not have words on this. On first viewing, you get the troglodytes aren't the lover type, but the women probably should have been fighters too, or at least one of them. It would connect to what Chicory said. Well, I don't think I could ever kill a woman. And that could set up a scene where he would have to kill a female. I know that's your standard Hollywood arc. But the women how they are now, they would die from infections, sores, blood clots, you name it. On top of that, I just don't buy these troglodytes would raise infants. You know what I'm saying? Maybe like a feral nanny? <laughs> We come full circle, which is a popular thing to do. I love it anyway. Here we see an almost identical shot of the survivors exiting compared to the degenerates entering in the beginning, symbolizing the start and the end of the danger. For some odd reason, the editor flips the survivors image, which is pretty disappointing because it's cool how it was originally. It's the same angle. This also now changes Arthur's splint, putting it on the wrong leg. The story ends with a lover's kiss and three gunshots in the distance as a friend smiles. True to his word, Sheriff Hunt hung in there long enough to finish his mission. And that was Bone Tomahawk, a story with heavy themes of love and duty. Action is very raw and swift, pieced out sparingly, while consistently simmering in the charm of interesting characters. One of the best examples of telling a story without forced character arcs. Just put plain and simple, I absolutely love this movie. It is in my top favorite movies of all time. Taking the F's away from the A's, we get our final grade. A respectable 82. So far we have three movies graded on our Flaws and Oz series. Those videos are up on the channel. Check them out, they're trained to Busan. Boondock Saints, and you just got done watching Bone Tomahawk. Also, stay tuned for Krampus, that's coming up next, as well as Gremlins, and soon, Night of the Living Dead. If you want to help get these released weekly on a consistent basis, join the Map Mob through the YouTube membership option, or check out the Ronnie Hayes Patreon. Links will be in the video description. And a massive thank you for the current support. Without it, these videos simply could not happen.